Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, uh, the first session is a lecture uh, by uh, Professor Abdullah Saif. Uh, professor Abdullah is a professor at the Faculty of Law, Economics, and Social Science at uh, Mohammed V University in Rabat, Morocco. He received his PhD in law at the University uh, of uh, Paris II. Paris II, and lectured in many Moroccan and French universities before being tasked with a ministerial portfolio for education between 1998 and 2000. And then he served as minister for education until 2002. Uh, Professor Saif chairs the Center for Research in the Social Sciences, and he is a director of the Moroccan Journal of Social Sciences. Besides advising the World Health Organization and other international bodies, he is the author of 20 published books. Professor Abdullah Sabah Al Khair, Professor Abdullah, and welcome to our winter school. Okay, so I. Uh, over, uh, to you, uh, your lecture, then we open the floor for uh, Q A's. Go ahead, Professor. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. If you allow me, please, I will be speaking in Arabic. I would like uh, from the outset, can you all hear me well? Yes, we can, we can hear you. I would first of all like to, to give some observations about our topic, uh, and that is populism in the Arab world. This is known, and I've been hearing this in the last few days of the winter school program that uh, the concept of populism is used but uh, its content and uh, the connotations and the, the concepts behind it are not uh, referring to very precise uh, things and it's used according to the context it's uh, used in and everybody here knows how to use the adjective uh, populist in this region and in the political developments relating to it. But first, I would like to say that populism is not a specific defined political system. And it can be referred to more as a political behavior pertaining to the people, to their interests, to their ambitions, and also and I don't and uh, also it's important to note that uh, that, that to understand other uh, uh, terms like opportunism and others and in many cases it seems to me that uh, this is more like an 
uh, an insult or an accusation from a political point of view. I will not delve uh, too long into the literature available in political science about populism, but uh, despite that, there are some general features that make uh, populism can be understood as this man says, he, he combines contradictory features, like, for example, the demand, the, like universal suffrage on the one hand, and he also uh, uh, links that to some sort of an authoritarianism linked to a charismatic leader, and within the system, there is the demand for social justice. At the same time, the right of people to own an ownership of property and their right to oppose the elites, which are considered some sort of an enemy of the nation, who do not uh, seek anything but to further their own interests. Um, also, political science uh, provides us with the different uh, classifications of uh, populism. Peter Wolfley, for example, or Margaret uh, Canovan, to distinguish between the populism of peasants and the, the populism which is linked to farmers and the life of farmers and the political populisms. And Canovan, sees uh, that there are uh, populism in the suburbs like this and also there is the tea party in the united states or the peasant movement in eastern europe in rising or socialist the socialist movement uh, or, uh, of the rural uh, socialism. These are a series of populisms which are linked to the nature of people who are recruited into it, political populisms, and we know the different patterns like uh, Peron's uh, a populist dictatorship, uh, also a democratic populism, which uh, appears in different uh, movements calling for participation, uh, universal suffrage, also the reactionary populisms, which was represented by many candidates uh, to lead uh, many uh, movements. The symbol which is mentioned was as George Wallace or the populism that we, we see in our part of the world in a much clearer way, and that is the current populism of uh, the political actors. All these classifications and uh, the one I gave uh, as I gave as an example like Canavan, we find some of their features represented and manifested in our region because we care uh, far too much on, on populism of others and we uh, speak uh, about them. Uh, in fact, the populism shows features which we can call as 
general features, but the question remains, are there specific distinguishing uh, features according to the historical context or the economic, social, and cultural context as it is present in our region? Is there a convergence to, with what we can call a universal model or example and what is, what is uh, present in our region? My first point in this presentation and uh, that is the importance of investing uh, in researching the history of the Arab populism. I will not uh, remind you of the historical uh, concept in, and what is known in the political literature in the Arab world in general since at, at least the 19th century and how this concept has been used, where did it come from, was it present before, and if so, how was it present, and also we can remind ourselves here that the historians used to use a, a diff, many many concepts and descriptions like the public or the commons, but rarely the term people was used and we could not easily find. The research I managed to follow, there is something which can be suitable to these concepts, but the concept of uh, uh, people is not there in a way which is indicative of what we're talking about. And the famous saying by Abu Qasim al-Shabi, the Tunisian, Tunisian poet, that if the people one day wanted to, to live, etc., etc., to the rest of the verse, I consider that as part and parcel of the contemporary uh, concept. So therefore, if we, if we want to study the history of the Arab countries, this appears to me as promising from the point of view of research, but um, very little has been invested in that and we do not have um, much data on the origins of the term people here. For this reason, I say this is a very good and big project for research in the future, for research agenda to take this into account. As for the founding uh, myths uh, surrounding the establishment of the nation state in the recent past, the term people appears as one of the sources for the legitimacy for the regimes which were established as a result of gaining independence. These regimes used to be based on the idea of building a nation state and all the founders, if you can call them that, the Mujahideen in Algeria, to the Burgibian legacy in Tunisia, all of them, including uh, the monarchy in Morocco and in Egypt, all these uh, exper experiences refer in the beginning to the concept of people, in, especially in the stages of building this, the nation state. Also, the early reforms, not the early ones, the reforms which uh, were widely spreading in the 80s and 90s uh, added to the concept of 
people in the founding stages on, of this uh, state has uh, really entered into this uh, legacy uh, many things which rather confused uh, things like for example uh, uh, large uh, sections of populations uh, becoming poorer to the extent of uh, threatening the, the incumbent systems and also the privatization which spread in the 80s and 90s and the reforms, the structuring reforms also caused tensions and turned the social pyramids which were existing at that time and so much so that societies have become very difficult to be led with the same uh, previous or past authoritarian methodologies and as a result of the openness which uh, were uh, manifesting themselves in very different and diverse ways in that time, the era of openness appeared to many that uh, political openness which uh, uh, entailed the risk of new actors who were no less authoritarian than their predecessors. <coughs> who believed in uh, Arab socialism. The argumentations which were presented by the conservative elites and the risk of uh, instability to justify the status quo and also to, to engage in or continue in, in the practice of ruling their countries. The basic problem, the basic problem so far as these are concerned is that the previous leaders, despite that and in various degrees, left behind a kind of achievements or accomplishments which were incomplete, but yet, and despite that, had some sort of content, like the Borgibian uh, legacy in Tunisia, and for fear of, uh, for fear of uh, uh, opening the scene, for new actors and to redistribute uh, uh, political positions and material positions and economic gains within the circle of the same old elites. Um, for example, the class of businessmen appeared very clearly and manifested itself clearly. Uh, we are talking about Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Algeria, Morocco, and other parts of the elites who could not break into this very well-guarded circle of elites which were in power before them because they had nothing left to them except for uh, resorting to unstructured economy and other uh, other uh, sources like smuggling etc as some research indicates within this horizon the Arab world tried 
a kind of populism which we can consider as a unique populism which played uh, a very fundamental role in uh, providing legitimacy or confining the legitimacy on the regimes whereby the people who have become liberated and organizes itself within frameworks of establishment has become the fundamental source for legitimacy of legitimacy for these new regimes. And this populism we cannot separate or distinguish from the national popular uh, uh, the, the uh, the, 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 what Nazar, Naz, Nasser and Nazarite movements and Gaddafi afterwards who all presented themselves as the sons of the people and the path they have chosen uh, according to official bibliography is uh, linked to a very holy bond uh, and linkage to the people and this kind of vision has become part and parcel of the founding uh, myths of these uh, regimes and around them of course uh, 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 many uh, 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 an elite which claimed that they manifested the will of the people and the ambitions of the people uh, uh, joined them and uh, after this wave our generation has lived uh, the period of uh, referenda uh, which was a necessary tool at that time to establish these regimes on, on a source of legitimacy which is from the outside. The regimes started using this referenda very intensively to uh, regain some sort of uh, consideration for these regimes. Although it was by and large uh, done in a sort of artificial nominal way. And within all of this was happening within a framework of pan Arab nationalism. And, and please allow me to use the term uh, closed nationalism. And the people who was supposedly was to accept and embrace, and in fact, this uh, authoritarian movement was addressing the people throughout and in all cases, including cases where which was clear for the Nazarite style uh, regimes to recruit the, the working class, as they used to say. But the same can be said about the monarchies, to although slightly differently, the populism played a certain role which allowed the regimes, including the monarchies, to solidify their legitimacy and to also push away the competition. During the Arab Spring and in the elections of 2010-2011, populism uh, gained a new breath 
and two breaths which uh, uh, made uh, the social, economic, and political conditions appear to have changed. And uh, the regimes under this conception, which was prevailing in the region, that the people have become an organized, unified, or consistent block, which has its say in all matters. The founding discourse, which was which was based on the martyrs of the revolution in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, Tunisia, after 2011, as if uh, the people had turned on the regimes, even in the slogans which were raised, which is very apparent now, slogans like people want and people uh, and the army are hand in hand, and also the military responses also started appearing and the military which has no hesitation to resort to force like in the case of Syria and at the end of the first phase after the failure of the first uh, round of the revolution and when some regimes like Iraq and Libya were marginalized, all of this happened under the threat اتضح بأن هناك بروز شعبوية أعيد تملكها بشكل مختلف ولكن تشتغل على نفس الأسس للمرحلة السابقة وهنا وقع نوع من تلاقي Three trends. Which were, which were inspired by populism, nationalism, and pan nationalism or Arabism. And all of this is linked to a central role played by the state. The best example of this is the model of the personality of the current Egyptian head of state. The system works on establishing relationships by people supporting the president absolutely. For example, if we watch just randomly any channel, we see this message being reinforced that personalization and the self personifying the regime has reached the maximum, the state and the military are present. In, in everywhere where there is a responsibility as if this is uh, an act of uh, fate to and destiny to guarantee the collective future of everybody, the people and the country and everyone and everything. And of course, all the accomplishment which are uh, uh, shown on the 
the second Suez Canal, the new uh, capital, the official capital, also radical nationalism in the current uh, world situation, international situation, there is some sort of uh, a fever, a national fever, which is directing uh, all these leaders and uh, work in favor of these leaders to portray them as they are very important, uh, not only for their own people, but also for those who, uh, who protect them at the international level. This nationalist uh, pan, oh, sorry, nationalism has entered into all spaces and also what we what we uh, notice when demonstrations were held in the case of the islands of uh, Sanafir and Tehran in Egypt show that clearly so therefore this is on the one hand and a, a fundamental uh, side for that matter, the group of people or countries who lived through the experience of the Arab Spring, we remember the demands of democracy, democratization, social justice were strongly present. Whereas the, the counter uh, dynamism, which acted as a counter revolution, had nothing to say but to continue the status quo, to, and that is the authoritarian, populist kind of regimes and governments, which uh, which uh, were uh, 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 now ha were known to uh, have uh, uh, a lack in, in resources, also a tendency to arm and arm racing, and also uh, the diminishing rentier economies, resources, etc., etc. This, this gives us an idea of the track where things were heading before the Arab Spring and after the Arab Spring. And by track, I mean the populist track, it's still there, it's still present, and also consistent so far as the different prevailing conditions are concerned in, in, in the North African countries, we notice some sort of uh, dismantlement of the, the state. I don't mean by that total collapse, but also we see some peripheral uh, spaces are gaining more space within the system and the regional specificities now are more prominent in the east, there is uh, the phenomena of uh, militias and militias, also the weakness in the national uh, ties between the different factions, uh, the insecurity, and the questions about citizenship, democracy, all of these things have changed. 
Now it's almost uh, surrealistic to talk about how some trends which were victorious by way of democratic uh, transformation in the beginning of the century now look so distant and so far away in the past. This is so far as the question of uh, the necessity to uh, revisit the history of the reappearance of populist movements in the region. And of course, there are different uh, readings from uh, different points of view. I think uh, uh, large components of our generation have lived through this experience and the track that I have just described. What I would like to focus on, second point, that is the dimensions of populism in the Arab world. Here I want to pause to shed some light on some features. This is a very wide ranging topic, very long. I'll be brief and mention some aspects only and some dimensions which I deem to be d distinguishing the situation more than the other populisms which are present in other parts of the world. The first observation that comes to mind here is that the populism or populisms not static, they're not stagnant. They, they are a pro, an open processes, processes which are linked to different contexts. For example, if you want to talk about populism in Tunisia, then that refers specifically to the situation or the case of Tunisia. Some make the distinction between the nostalgic kind of populism, which uh, reminds us of the previous authoritarian regime. There's also the leftist populism, which is still relying on the basic concepts of the leftist discourse, for example, regarding imperialism, the World Bank, and the limited nature of the reforms that the revolution uh, brought about, and also the kind of populism that demonizes the elites and calls for positions closer to the people and the kind of discourse which uh, promises to end uh, corruption, bribery, and uh, social problems and issues. And of course, the chief amongst those is the question of achieving social justice. Populism without these different uh, factions, if we, if we set aside the current uh, presidency,
So the elections within this uh, perception is, takes a special position and special standing which uh, improves the populist uh, uh, discourse that everything that comes to power through elections should be criticized and critiqued. This was uh, aimed at the Islamists and some leftist factions and also to criticize and critique uh, the mediators who came or you know, stood in the way between people and the authority. All of this is the result of the culture, digital culture, which is prevailing now. These, all of these things uh, based on, on the new situation with the media, and culture and education. And let us also note that in the United States, in the case of Donald Trump, the media played an opposite role, like CNN and others uh, toward Trump and the elections, and even Facebook was uh, closed, the council was closed. Uh, in the Arab case, Tunisia, and in the case of Egypt, uh, more evidently, The, the international populism promised to, by and large, promised to a redistribution of resources and establishing social justice in a way that guarantees the rights of citizens and reducing taxes. The current Egyptian populism there uh, shows uh, some sort of a neoliberal conviction, although in a different way, but yet it remains a kind of populism which supports the establishment, the existing prevailing regime and its components like the security apparatus, the elites which are still controlling things, and also the authoritarian side here is evident and the same applies to Morocco. This is a third model in the Moroccan case, uh, populism takes a different uh, manifestation which seems to be more artificial and more on the rhetorical side. And the populist uh, trend started appearing from 2012, like uh, that the Justice and Development Party, when they used to lead the government, and many described this party as a populist regime par excellence, but this was not confined to Islamists because this uh, description was used afterwards to establish the identity of similar political features or cases which appeared on the political scene in Morocco, names like Ashkar al-Umari and other personalities. And this matched, at the same time, a retreat on the side of technocrats. Before that, the equation was such that 
the technocrats retreated and political parties advanced and so have politicians. Now the populists are advancing and uh, the technocrats are going back. This was in the beginning, but now the situation has changed. Now it's the opposite. Now the, the situation in the political life as a result of exchanging blows between the different political factions and because of the way the state has run the affairs, political affairs of the country since the Arab Spring and how it strengthened the social movement and gave it a larger role. For example, what happened in Husayma and Jarada. This marginalized uh, uh, regions started uh, engaging uh, in a kind of relationship which is based on conflict with the central state a lot more than before although it has not reached the point of total national contradiction. In a city like Husayma, living some sort of an uprising, we see the nearest town very quiet and appears to be carefree and the same. Wujda is close to it, but nothing happened in Wujda for in comparison. We also notice the reaction after uh, the Islamist uh, populism, which used to lead the government and the populists who were opposing them, we find a return of the technocrats and the businessmen as if the political actors have shrank in numbers uh, very quickly. Uh, how much time do I have left, Mr. Chair? Uh, please uh, close in five minutes. So the first feature is uh, the populisms cannot be separated from their context. There are different dynamics and different contexts and should be understood within these contexts and these dynamics. Sometimes generalization uh, really uh, makes our analysis depart from a correct reading of how things are. The second uh, observation, uh, and to uh, number two, populism has taken the pattern of uh, relying on rhetoric. The, all these cases that I mentioned in the Arab region, and in order to analyze Populism, we must refer to their political discourse, which is a discourse based on crisis, and it is in the service of the current political life, especially in the in times of elections. The populist discourse, I studied some samples, of these uh, rhetorics and like Binky Rand's statements and discourse and some of his opponents outside the Justice and Development Party who present themselves as secularists 
I took samples from the discourse employed in Tunisia. We, in this, we find the common features of a populist discourse in uh, utilizing concepts uh, to express a feeling of panic, fear, vis-a-vis -vis a crisis, the economic crisis, which is considered at the same time a crisis of uh, values and to uh, reiterate that uh, the value system, the identity of the nation is diminishing and all the traditions, etc. This is concerning the Islamist discourse. And uh, opposite to that, the others, like the secularists, or some of them at least, uh, uh, also uh, re uh, trait that there is a hidden agenda, and also. Uh, we must uh, uh, go beyond the modernization, democracy, etc. Also, the concept of dividing everyone into a friend or a foe, the, the entity responsible for all these conditions is the regime itself and the corrupt elites. The other is the enemy because this enemy does not know or appreciate people's concerns or pains and has distanced itself, itself from that and placed the country in the hands of different lobbies and pressure groups which uh, influence the incumbent government. Also, the passion present in this kind of discourse and also the position of the people. The people are the center of democracy. People are the, people are the leader and the servant of the people par excellence and and, and this is the like the sacred holy face of uh, people and the sovereignty of people and the sovereignty of people is at the heart of everything and this reminds us of one of the universal features of populism and what Napoleon II has said when he said that the, the emperor is not a man, the emperor is the people, or the man of the people who, who wipes out all uh, the separating distance between the ruler and the ruled. And the final point, we don't have much time left to go through all the points, all the different feature, features of populism in our region. Uh, populism also refers to the style of government and uh, a certain part of public policy. I always consider that Latin America is more advanced than us in, by at least a decade. This may not be scientific, <laughs> estimation, but uh, at every time we talk about a central concept in political concepts which are important in our discipline, we see Latin America has done that and gone through that a decade earlier. And I estimate the 
distance between us and them by about 10 years. Of course, in the case of uh, populism, maybe even Juan Domingo Perón, Agas, Ibarra, Adasco Ibarra, all of these represent uh, the first uh, uh, phase of populism in Latin America. And uh, at that time, the center of this uh, populist movement was the people were the original conquerors of Latin America and uh, against the oligarchies and the imperialists who, who used to reject the pattern of industrialization which started appearing in that period. After that, and uh, in view of the second wave and the economic crisis, this, uh, the populism in that phase returned strongly in Peru, Argentina, and Brazil. Populism, in fact, won the day. They won because of uh, they thought that the people in power was a corrupt elite. Carlos Menem, Fernando de Melo, Alberto Fujimori in Peru. All of these have uh, collaborated with the International Monetary Fund to fight against poverty and, uh, uh, and uh, they launched public policies which all uh, are compatible with the new market economy, the new liberal vision of the economy. They tried to improve the lot of the poorer sections of their societies. This was the second phase. The third phase, which is close to us now, uh, we can say it's still going on under the leadership of Hugo Chavez and the likes of him, according to the, like Morales, Rafael Correla, Daniel Ortega, all of this rejected the idea of the market economy of the second phase and they built a new perception of the people and the people as a victim, the victim of an economic system built on discrimination and exclusion. And uh, they adopted uh, constitutional reforms to limit the authority of the elites in power and to also to face up to the opposition, which is still trying to cause trouble, strife, and uh, uh, act as a strong opposition to populist governments. Uh, on this side, we can say that this is something which we can notice in the Arab world, and that is the socio-economic uh, approach tends to ID identify populism as a certain type of uh, political and economic policies which uh, 
whereby we see large amounts of money are allocated and that all are financed by foreign debt, which is followed by a period whereby financial problems start occurring. This will be followed by plans to restructure the economy to respond to the deficit, which was which became uh, came about as a result of the indebtedness and uh, the behavior in an irresponsible way in the running the affairs of the country or managing the resources and dealing with the question of redistributing the wealth and the resources of the country. This is what has been noticed in the populist, uh, where populists came to power and practiced ruling the country. I wanted to to also mention the question pertaining to democracy and the charismatic leaders and the specific nature of Islamist populism, but I take, I'll leave this point to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Abdullah, for this rich uh, lecture on populisms in plural in the Arab world. And we can understand that. Okay, we can understand that uh, we don't have one populism in the uh, in the Arab world. Uh, maybe the only ideal type of populism in uh, in the Arab world is the Tunisian case, and it was well discussed by Dr. Azmi Bishara in the opening lecture. The rest of the cases, I think, are sort of aspects, uh, sort of strategies, behaviors, as uh, Professor Saif said, uh, communication communication styles. Uh, used by both those who are in the in power and uh, the rest of uh, political actors or uh, parties. So uh, thank you again, Professor Saif, and I open the floor for discussion. Uh, if we have any questions or comments, okay, Kishoba, good morning. Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the rich presentation. And I have one small question uh, just because of my limited knowledge of, of the Arab world. And I wonder to what extent do you think that in the case of the Arab Spring, can we see certain traits of populism in there? Or do you think that it would be wrong to equate the Arab Spring to a sort of populist movement? Thank you, Chris Sobal, uh, Dr. Jamal from the Arab Center via Zoom. Fadal, Dr. Jamal. Dr. Abdullah. What you called for to study the history of uh, Populism in the Arab world is very important and necessary. I'm making the distinction between the general populism and the more accurate term of which crystallizes the concept of populism. Yes, the modern a social history in the Arab world in general and in Syria in particular has known this, uh, this uh, pattern in the specific, uh, according to the specific uh, definition and not the general term. And uh, in the period of the 40s, 50s, and even late 60s, populism was looked at uh, 
in a positive light in the political experience of the Levant. I wrote about this and I termed this the Horani populism as a model or example of Arab populism. This is a study which was published within a workshop which was organized to study the uh, populist movements in the late uh, 80s. I'm just uh, providing this example to say that the debate uh, on Arab populism was in existence and uh, our inability to distinguish between different types was due to our weakness in understanding it. The Horani populism, if you like, uh, had similarities with the Russian populist movement. This populism was led by intellectuals and educated class, which was presented similarly to what the Russian populist movement, the likes of Akram al-Hurani and Amjad Tarabulsi and Ihsan Husni, Nadam al-Saqqal, Fattah al-Zalta, all of these intellectuals until the 70s were very well known names and personalities who were present in the political and cultural debate in Syria and, and the Arab Levant in general. This specific populist uh, feature of uh, the Horani populism focused on the uh, peasant or farmer's life and aspect and hence the linkage with the Russian counterpart. But the question is, has the Horani populist was impacted by the Russian populist movement? In my estimation, the answer is no. And the explanation that is populism in the specific sense is based on an objective uh, background. This is different than the current situation where the social media, the media feed, uh, uh, feed into that. Uh, uh, war, people worship when the Syrian economy was based on agriculture and 75% of the economy relied on farming and agriculture and farmers and uh, even at the level of the national uh, constituent assembly there was a lot of debate on that so we have a common denominator with this and the linkage with the issue of uh, agriculture and farmers and this in fact in the 40s and 50s was prevalent in the Arab Levant because the Arab parliaments were not able to deal with this, so the military solved the problem by way of military coups in Syria and Iraq and Egypt and others. In parallel to that, there is a general political culture for the elites. In the 60s, there was some sort of a structural sweeping away of certain aspects of liberalism and everybody started uh, started moving towards Marxism, new Marxism and the leftist ideologies and the, also uh, the Arab intellectuals got to know this populism through the work of Latin American intellectuals. This was reflected in their writings. The question now is what has remained from that kind of populism? I think now it's confined 
to the history's museums, if we can call it that, because even uh, agrarian reforms, which was an advanced step from the point of view of history and uh, uh, social changes. Dr. Jamal, please. Yes, I agree with your call to understand uh, our research into Arab populism. Until now, the research into this, which uh, pertains to Arab populism, is uh, probably one study by Dr. Azmi Bshara, and he devoted that to the 50s. And also there are uh, interactions with the uh, uh, Arab nationalists and also be, and uh, the working class, which were included in the peasants. And of course, the ones who led the movement were intellectuals and not the peasants themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Duke. Dr. Jamal, do we have uh, any other or comments? Okay, uh, Professor Abdullah, uh, would you like to answer or uh, respond to these two comments? Um, we lived the Arab Spring in different countries, in Morocco and North, Northern African countries. In Morocco, it was less strong than what I personally witnessed in the same period in Tunisia or in Egypt. In that period, I observed or closely observed what was happening in the three countries. At least uh, we read about what happens in different Arab countries, but it must be said that according to my following the events of Arab Spring and my studies at the university, I found that populism was a component which cannot be denied from these waves of protest which uh, swept through the Arab countries. Populism was at the heart of these movements. And uh, the general trend was uh, a focusing on human rights, democratization, dignity, human rights, uh, political reform, social justice. This was strongly present, and we cannot ignore that. But there were also, at the same time, noticeable populist features in both the rhetoric and the behavior and the moral behavior, too. This is, so far as the first point is concerned, I cannot but uh, agree with uh, my friend Jamal for this call for more research into historical studying. Of course, the present merits that, both the past and the present. Maybe there can be relations that can be established, I don't know, until we finish the research. Although I have one issue with the way it has been, the, the current political features have been dealt with because there is a tendency that I call that uh, really uh, to focus uh, excessively on the present and the recent events 
and the, the happenings, the latest developments, etc. Sometimes these things uh, 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 dominate the analysis. I agree with Jamal on the historical dimension, and this is what I call for to in the 70s, when we were younger, in the leftist trends, we, we lived through a period where the left used to call for people to go down to the street and be the students' movements in the 70s in Morocco was like that. And at the international level in Europe, France, and Latin America, I was studying in France. There was a strong movement. Uh, but uh, suddenly, this the prominent figures of the left uh, have disappeared. And soon after that, we hear that uh, they went to the farms and factories, etc. This reminds me of what uh, Jamal has said. When, when I, I uh, when the similarity you mentioned, and the similarity between Syria and Russia, I think merits more research, more. This is what I can say. Is there any other uh, comment? Uh, or I think we should leave it there. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah. We have the honor to have you with us in this winter school. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And we, I would like to apologize for the shifting of the schedule. We meet, uh, Brahim, five minutes. It will be... Okay, five minutes. Let's say five minutes. Okay, after five minutes of coffee, Shukran, we uh, meet again to listen to the presentation of Francisco on populism and localism, new cities and the rise of corporate populism in Palestine. See you. شكرا جزيلا استاذ عبد الله